Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the Pantera Studios and our musical accompaniment and our special guest who <coughs> flew in from Lyon, France via Iceland and beautiful downtown Detroit. <laughs> Andrea and I picked him up at Los Angeles International Airport around noon yesterday. Our very good friend Jean-Paul Sampoutou. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I have been looking for this. And now I'm home. Yeah. <laughs> so we have known Jean Paul for about seven years. And uh, we only had the pleasure of meeting him in person. Once, Jean Paul moved closer into the camera. Ooh. I mean, into the, the field. We only had the opportunity to meet him in person once on the uh, beaches of Tijuana, <laughs> Rosarita. Uh, Jean Paul was banned from the US, or let's say just excluded from getting a visa for about the last eight years. And so, uh, for some of you, you may know, many don't, Andrea had to live in Tijuana for, or Rosarita on the beach for two years while we adjusted some things. Um, and uh, uh, so Jean-Paul flew in from somewhere into Mexico and into Tijuana and came down and had a lobster dinner with us. Oh, and <laughs> yeah. He still he talks said, about oh. it. He said, mm, you know, that lobster, you know, remember that lobster? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only time we've been able to meet him, but um, we have stayed very close in touch and as he bounced around the world and called me from many different places and said, are we ready yet? <laughs> and I said, we're only ready when you can show up in Los Angeles and come sit in our living room and have a, have a little gathering. And so he had shown up, so we're ready. It's all his fault it took this long. <laughs> so, um, anyways, we were introduced via a man named Roy from the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean who lives in New York, uh, who I met through <coughs> my friend Jim, when at one point we thought, through one of the various bait and switch sort of scenarios, we thought we were going to be very integrally involved in facilitating capital moving into countries to be able to start rebuilding infrastructure and projects and so forth. And Roy, uh, who is a project man who's been looking forward for years to implement uh, visions and projects. Hi, Roy, uh, who calls me all the time. Are we ready? <laughs> um, of his own. And uh, somewhere along the line, you connected with Roy and he connected me with you and you connected me with many other people and uh, who are... So Roy introduced me to Jean-Paul and Jean-Paul has introduced me to uh, many of his friends, uh, most of whom are uh, very uh, dedicated to the principle of service to the world, service to others, building projects, rebuilding Africa, uh, things like that. Um, Jean-Paul is a world-class ambassador for peace and forgiveness and this is where we have always connected with Jean-Paul and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about his story and how he came to be the ambassador for peace and forgiveness and uh, he is now the official ambassador for peace and forgiveness for the Pantera Dior Private Society uh, as well as one of the key directors of our soon-to-be expanding music department and music and cultural department for the Gemstone Global Media Alliance. Um, so welcome to our home, Jean-Paul. Nice Thank to you. have you back home. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, 
Uh, where would you like to begin? I would like to begin by saying that thank you for forgiving me for taking too long. <laughs> well, to there is no forgiveness required <laughs> on that. Yeah. But you tell me, you want me to tell the story or? Yeah, I know you've told it many times. Yeah. Um, but it is your story and, uh, and, and we're going to post this on our YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. So this will be available to the public and, mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways it's one of the um, uh, sort of uh, launching uh, files for the Gemstone Global Media Alliance mm -hmm. and uh, what better of a launch than for you to be here with us and tell us your story and, and your journey uh, which is an extraordinary one um, and how you arrived to be who you are today. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it starts with, unfortunately, some very serious events in, mm. in Central Africa, in your country of Rwanda. Mm. And um, why don't you uh, just give us a little summary, and you don't have to go into a lot of detail, <coughs> but... Mm -hmm. um, do you mind uh, if I start the way I start all the time? with an acapella, just one minute. So of course not, please do. I know Andre will love that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I will know or a Baba Tishanga. He married a Chinga Kawako. Now Kurokoka. Twenty four years of suffering. Twenty four years of wandering. Twenty four years of remembering. Dori mnya kama kumnya viri nini rashize Tukwebo kawa chot kwa avuze Watu vuya motu tabisha ka Ima niwa hero okori da shira Twenty-four years of suffering Twenty-four years of wandering, twenty-four years of remembering. No more genocide in Rwanda. No more genocide in the world. No more, no more, no more, no more. No more, no more, no more, no more, no more. I shake him now. In 1994, we had the genocide in Rwanda, and one million people were murdered, only just in 90 days. And brothers killed brothers, husband we kill their wives because the wives are Tutsi, husband are Hutu because they wanted to show that we are proud of being Hutu. They had to kill their wives or the children just to show that we are Hutu. So I think I will go back in the history just to know who are Hutus. It's good to know that before. And who were the Tutsis? Yes, who were the Tutsi, what the Tua. Rwanda uh, is a small country in East Africa. Rwanda is between Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, and Congo. In north of Rwanda, we have Uganda. In south, we have Burundi. And uh, west, we have Democratic Congo, the country Congo, big country, and in east we have Tanzania. And Rwanda was colonized by Belgium. 
Uh, we have three tribes, ethnic group. We have Hutu who are majority, 85%. And we have Tutsis, 14%. And we have Abatwa, they are pygmies, 1%. So those tribes, for a long time, they lived together in a good harmony and they were under a king. And, and the king, in the one Rwandan traditional, a king was for all, was not a, a king who would not have any tribe. Of course, a king was a Tutsi, every king was a Tutsi and then he would pass on his throne to, the, to his son. They were Tutsi, but King was described as a father of a nation without having any ethnicity. So when the Belgians came to colonize Rwanda, they found this country unique, only one language. Because in Africa, the only countries that have only one language is Rwanda, Burundi, and Somalia. All those countries other countries in Africa, they have more than 20 languages and 20 tribes. We only have three tribes and only one language. So it was very difficult for Belgians to govern Rwanda. In other words, I would say it was very difficult to, di to, to divide and to divide, yes. Mm -hmm. Because that, that political science divided the country. That's what Europe is trained yes. at doing. Yeah, but in Rwanda it didn't work. Yeah. Because it's very difficult for a country that have only one language and just three tribes. So what they did in 1933, they, they started the identification cards. They created that and they gave to Rwandans identification card where you, the, your ethnicity is mentioned in your ID. Mm. So I had one because uh, before the genocide to happen, every Rwandan had an ID where you is Hutu, you are Hutu, you are put and Tutsi. So when you ask me when, what is the origin of the genocide or violence in Rwanda, I will always say in 1933 when the Belgians start, uh, created their identification cards. So it, every Rwandan had this card um, and uh, until 1958 where the king that time called Ruda Higwa discovered that Belgians have divided Rwanda. And he said, enough is enough. We don't want this. I want to stop this. We need to change. We need to have an ID where it's writing, written Rwandan, not Tutsi Hutu. When he said that, they killed him. That's how the king was killed. That's how every, the first genocide started there. Because when King Udehigo was dead, uh, they tried to put uh, his brother because he didn't have children. His brother became king. They want to kill him and he escaped. And every Tutsi, many Tutsi did, went outside the country. Uganda had all many Tutsis. Uh, yeah. Tutsis who are able to flee the country, they went. So here are the Tutsis 30 years later. They said, we don't, we, we are we are fed up to live in exile. We need to come back to our country. So that's where they invited Rwanda because they have tried to come peacefully. The president of Rwanda was saying all of the time that uh, when a glass is full, you cannot put more water. This is something he, everybody knows when he was saying that there is no Tutsi who must come to Rwanda, stay where you are. Rwanda is full, there's no place for you. So they came by force. When they, entered, they, they, they actually they attacked Rwanda, the 1st October 1994. I was living in Rwanda touring. Actually, when they started, I was touring with my band. So, and we knew that. Fourth day, we knew in the news, they said, cockroaches, 
has had attacked Rwanda, mm -hmm. which means cockroaches. When I say in Rwanda, cockroaches are tutsi. That's the name they gave us. Mm -hmm. So, 4th October, I was going to go out as so military everywhere. Come. Every tutsi had to go to prison because the radio said the, en the enemy is among you. Mm. We thought the enemy is the people who attacked Rwanda. That's the, the speech of President Habyarimana at that time. So we were in the enemies. So I found we were, they put us, they took, the people said Jean Paul live here, they knew. I was a band leader, a well known band leader of the band, a well known band in Rwanda in Gedi. I was the chief, I was so of the band, it was easy for to know who I am, where I am, and then they put us in the stadium, I remember, 4th October 19, 1990. I found 1,000 people in, in, a, in the stadium, and we spent six days without eating, with nothing to eat, nothing to drink. So, because many people were, uh, all the stadiums were full of people, they tried to transfer everyone to prison. So I went to prison of Gitarama, my friend's musician and all that, they went to Kigali. All so I, I went to Gitarama for six months. Uh, in that prison six months, what happened, the international community decided, uh, asked Habyarimana, why you put all these innocent people in prison? They don't have anything to do with the with the, the robbers who attack the country. Of course, yes, they are Tutsis, but they don't know. They live. They are in Rwanda. They there's no, nothing to do. So that's where the plan of doing a genocide started. Mm. Habyarimana is her cabinet. The former president Habyarimana. They went to a cabinet in the government. They said that. We don't have food to feed these prisoners. Why not to kill them? Then when the Tutsi will come, continue to attack, they will not find anybody. They will not have an relatives. So let us kill them and let us... Having, we have to let every prisoner to go his home village where we were, they, they, they were born and we do a list of the whole Tutsi. And and we kill them. So that's why we were happy to go out. We were released. So we went home. I went to my village. And then my father was there and my mother. They knew that I'm, I'm, I'm released. They were happy to see me. And my father told me, I have to talk to you. Come. We went to his room and he said, You need to take your things away. Well, I don't know what you have. And you need to leave the country you need to to go to Burundi or Uganda, you are well known there because they gonna kill Tutsis. They don't just release you. There is a plan, they gonna kill Tutsis. Then I ask my father, why? Why, if you want me to go, why, why can't we go, all of us? Why, if you know they were, kill, they were gonna kill Tutsi, why, why can't we flee together? And he said, no. Jean-Paul, I'm old, I have been in this road before, I have fled the country in 1958 when they killed Tutsi, and 1960 and 1963, every time they would kill Tutsi, we go. Now I'm old, I'm fed up, I will stay here, I will die here, but I want you to be protected, you and your brother, just you have to go. So I went to Kigala, sold a mini bus. I had a bus for, for band, I sold it quickly, and I went to Burundi. It was 1991 in March, I was in Burundi. So I started a tour in Burundi, I went to Uganda, I went even to Brussels, I was invited in Germany in Brussels in 1993. I recorded and I came back to Uganda because I, my base was in Uganda. Because I was in Uganda knowing that uh, the, 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 the war will end soon and come back to Rwanda. So, while I was in Uganda, 
it was in May 1994 during the genocide. The genocide started 6 April. In May, that's where I knew the news about what happened in my family. They killed my father, they killed my mother, and three, my three brothers and my sister. So, I knew that maybe, I said, maybe my three brothers, I knew when I went to Rwanda. I knew that they killed my father and my mother. But my three brothers, I was thinking, I will find them. So, the war, the genocide stopped on 22nd July 1994. And the same day, 22nd, I was in Kigali and I went to Butare, where I was born in my village. When I went home, I found the house empty. So I, I tried to, to ask some neighbors what happened and, uh, and uh, why you are walking in the, in the street, you, I was seeing cadavers and it was stinking. It was horrible. Um, so I found <coughs> a neighbor called Emmanuel. He was running there. I saw him there running, saying, It's Vincent! It's Vincent who killed your father! It's Vincent who killed your father! And he was not to know me. He was traumatized. So I told him, Come, keep quiet, keep quiet. I want to talk to you. How you know it's Vincent who killed my father? Why? Because Vincent is a, a friend of mine. We grew up together. He was a very good friend of mine and, uh, and he was our neighbor and he was the principal of the school there in our village and he was a very good friend of my father. So I said, I said, Vicent, do you think Vicent can do that? And he told me this and another friend called Eugene, we confirmed this. So when I learned that it's Vicent who did that, it destroyed my life. That was the day I start drinking, I started taking drugs and I will always, when I remember that Vincent did this and I will try to find him and kill him. That was the, when I had the idea of killing in my first time, that was the first time I had an idea of killing somebody. I didn't know how I was going to kill him, but the spirit of revenge was in me now, and I always I will, <coughs> I will drink when I have those thoughts. So I had to continue to to walk to to start my band, and here is the end of the war. Everybody start to walk, I start to new life, but. I will do everything I do with self-destruction, killing myself, trying to find peace and then kill him. Why I, why I don't, I cannot find him, then I kill myself with alcohol. I, I end up being an, an uh, alcoholic addicted in 2002, where I couldn't sing anymore, I couldn't, I couldn't show up on my, honor my contracts as a musician. Having, yes, of course, I, uh, I was married in 1995 and uh, the second child was born with a disability, you know, defic intellectual deficiency. I had to send my wife in Canada and I have to come to Canada in 1998 with my firstborn to try to see what happened with my daughter. I found myself and my daughter will not leave. She will, she's handicapped. She's So all this another trauma that comes in my life and then I we had problems with my wife she was not also okay with the, because of the daughter I had to leave Canada I went back to Africa and I said I want to die there so in 2002 I was somewhere with drugs and I was laying down three days without going out. I was um, like dead. So friends of mine said, Jean Paul is dead. What we have to do something. So some said we have to bring him to the hospital. 
and people said, no, he's dead, we, we just, we wait to see, but um, before we bring him to the hospital, let us bring him, him somewhere we can pray for him, because, you know, when somebody dies, they, they cannot put you on, a, they, they have to, be, to, to, to pray and say, God, receive his soul. So they brought me somewhere in a mountain in Uganda, and uh, they start to pray. They are praying, God, oh, he, is, he did good things in life, now he's dead, please forgive his sin. So that people were having hands by hands. I was in the middle, just laying down, then people praying. I found myself, people praying for me, and a voice telling me, while I'm there, that voice was saying, you will not die, Jean-Paul. You will only have to make a choice. And that choice is forgiving Vincent. You are in prison of revenge, hatred, resentment. What you have to do is just say, yes, I'm forgiving Vincent, then you're, you will bring life, your, your, you will bring back your life. So, suddenly, I said, eh, did you hear that voice? I told people, everybody were worried. They said, which voice? We were praying for you. I said, I heard a voice telling me that I'm not going to die, I have to forgive. So, some people who are there, they were saying, yeah, this is God. This is God who is telling you to forgive. We were praying for you. So God heard us and, and, <laughs> and now he's, I didn't want anybody to tell me about God because I was angry at God. I was, actually I was not a believer because after the genocide, the first thing I did when I, I was in my village, that time when I was in my house, the house empty, I composed a song saying, God, where were you? Because we have a proverb in Rwanda that says, God spends a day away, but he returns back to Rwanda. So God may go to America during the day, to Uganda, to Sierra Leone, but he comes back to Rwanda. It's a common proverb. Then I was, so I composed a song saying, where were you? Why? Why people kill others? Why? And I was so angry that I didn't want anybody to tell me about God. And that's so I found myself in mountain, people praying for me. Actually, I said, how I came here? I didn't know how I went there. They said, you are dead. Now God is healing you. I said, don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. I don't want anybody to tell me about God. You know what Christians did in during the genocide? Priests killed they are Christians. Christians kill Christians. Don't tell me about God. I don't want to hear that. And I composed that as a cause. I remind them of the, comp the song I composed. This song is known also in Rwanda. Like that what they say. Uh, in that song I say, Bimaziki Kubaho. Bimaziki Kubaho means existing. Bimaziki. Why? Uh, there's no interest. Because I composed that song, I was angry the same week when I went to my village. And that song, I said, I didn't ask you to create me. It's a song everybody saw, whoever ran the gym, so they love those song, songs because they, it shows the, the, the anger and the, the, how they hate God because he, <clears throat> we thought, we were thinking it's God who did that. So, people were killed in the churches. People went to churches knowing, oh, this is God's house. Nobody will kill them, kill us here. Mm -hmm. They will fear that we are here. But actually the priests, the people they worship together, they are the ones who kill them. Mm -hmm. So people forgot that they are Christian. They said we are Hutu. So Hutus are more important than being, you are more Hutu than, than Christian. Christian. Yeah. So I didn't want anybody to. To tell me about God. So I will stay in that mountain. Uh, I spent three months in that mountain. Hearing that voice every day. 
I will sleep tonight at three in the morning. The voice will come. Hmm. You become what you don't forgive. Forgiveness is for you, not for the offender. Then we, I will speak with someone, telling me things, telling me that forgiveness means to release from your bondage. Forgiveness means to release from your prison of bitterness. Forgiveness will free you. Forgiveness is for you. So, I will go with those words and I will always, they will come in my thoughts. So, one day, I said, I'm fed up to, leave, to, 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 to always hearing this voice. I have to do something. I've tried everything. It didn't work. I went to witch doctors, people. I tried everything. So, let me try to say yes to this voice to see. If I say yes, maybe that it will not disturb me tonight when I sleep. Let me just say yes. It does not cost me anything. Let me say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was this something I will never forget in my life. It was 15 March. Andrea was asking me what your birth date. 15 March. I was born in 15 March. And 15 March, that, that was in 2003. I said yes. If you are God, <coughs> I don't know if you are God, you exist or not, but I say yes just to have peace. <laughs> yes, I'm going to forgive. You will tell me how they forgive. I will do. And I received something in me, a joy and happiness that I cannot describe. I started to laugh. I was feeling joy. I was, I was so happy and uh, and I was to stand, I was stand up on my feet, but I was feeling my feet are not on the soil. I was, they were just here. And I start to sing him, song like this, singing, uh, singing song with joy and crying, happiness, alone in the mountain, because it's a very good mountain with trees. People will go there to gather prayers. Miracles happens, people come with AIDS, they cancer, mm. they get healed, all people, come from America to go there when they have, they want to get healed, when you have that faith that you can, because many people know that it's a mountain of healing, people go there. So, in that day, I told people who are gathering tonight, uh, we, in the fire, always in the evening, they would put fire, people we gather, they it's a huge mountain. People, we come here, or that we come there. People who pray in the language of Kinyarwanda, we go there. People who pray in Swahili, there. People who English, there. So, gatherings every evening where people pray together. So, and I went to give the testimony. I told people who are there that you guys, you prayed for me. You guys, are, you know, I was saying no, no, I was angry. But today, it's 15 March. I said yes. When I said yes to God, I felt something not normal. I felt something powerful. So I think there is something in heaven. I don't know if it's in heaven or here. So I think there is something you call God, but I don't know. But me, I met, I don't know if you, the, the one you worship is the one I worship, but I met mine. I will, <laughs> because I heard the voice. I had, you know, I felt something. So, I'm ready to go to my village. I know Vincent is in prison. I will go there and tell him that God told me to forgive him. I'm ready to forgive and I will go. So, that's what happened. I went to my village. But I didn't go the same day because many miracles happened. I was in that mountain and things happened. And uh, I learned news. They get. They told me that I won a Cora Award in South Africa. Uh, while I was in the mountain, I got the news that um, I was selected among the best African artists. I'm the best African traditional artist, and then I was nominated as a promising African artist.
So in 6 December 2003, you were invited, you have your ticket and everything, you will go to see if you win. So you will have to travel. So I was in that mountain and some people who have, have been, I actually prophesied that one woman was just praying and said, say, God told me that you showed me that you got an award. That, I think you, you got an award before, but he didn't know you were just crazy. But now this year you have to go to take your award. So it happened, I went to take the award. And then after I came to America, I came to America 2004 because of that award, I was invited to come to World Culture Open in New York, Lincoln Center. And I won another award. I, have, I was able to go to bring my band in Rwanda. They paid everything I, I went to bring four people. So I started my career in America. Uh, touring everywhere, every state. You know, the, this America, I know the whole state except five states only. Mm -hmm. All the states I have been there performing from 2004 to 2008. I was in every state performing to universities, colleges, performing center, churches, as well as giving the message of forgiveness. I was invited at the UN in 2008 as a keynote speaker to speak about forgiveness and I went to Atlanta 2007 to receive the ambassador for peace you so all those things I'm saying I was it was too fast every six months getting an award but I had to do something I had to go to do to forgive Vincent in front to find him and forgive him so I went and I met his wife and I told him, I know Vincent is in prison and uh, I want you to tell him that God told me to forgive him. Tell him that I'm trying to go to Gachacha. Uh, Gachacha, I, will, I have to explain you what we call Gachacha in Rwanda, is a traditional court. Hmm. In the past, before the colonialists, People, we gather together when you do something bad in the community, they will come witness, they will come judges, and all the village will gather together. And those who committed things that we said, and the witness we say, you, and in front of people, and they will, you will be judged, and you will be, when you ask for forgiveness, it will be reconciliation or you'll be judged and something like that. Because it Kachacha they brought that system in order to to do justice for what happened in genocide. Because who to who didn't kill, you can just know the number, there are few. Because most majority of who to kill. So it was hard to to do to put them in justice. But what happened in Gachacha, everybody will go there and you will go and accuse those who killed your, your relatives and witnesses will be there and everybody will, they will say openly. So here is me Jean Paul Samputu to go to Gachacha. I wrote a letter that I will come. I know the people who killed my parents. I know I will come to testify. So because it's my village and because I'm known, I was born there. Thousand, thousand people came to see what I'm gonna talk. talk. So everybody was there. What, what time, what year was this? 2007, okay. in July. Mm -hmm. ah, it was something very, it was challenging times and, uh, but I was convinced. Uh, few people only knew what, uh, my message there because they didn't want to to talk to everyone that Jean, actually Jean Paul is going to forgive in public because they want they didn't want anybody because that was it was the first time I was the first person to do that everybody will go and will accuse <coughs> so I arrived there the journalists came many BBC was there many journalists was there in the room and Vincent was there because mm. when you go to the church, people, even if prisoners must to come, they must to be present. So, <coughs> my turn was there to speak. Then 
and I told everyone that I know who killed my parents and I know who organized the killings in our village. Nyiriman Eugene is here and Vincent is here. But I didn't come here to, to tell you the way people speak in the, in the gachacha. I came just here to forgive, to tell you Vincent that I've forgiven him. And uh, now I feel free, I feel happy that I have accomplished what God told me to do. So we met Vincent the first time. Uh, the first time after the war, after the war or the genocide, you know, because the last time I saw Vincent, it was, it was I think in 1989. So he was happy, and we went Vincent and Eugene. We went to share a meal in the well-known bar and hotel in Ibutare. All journalists behind us, everybody asking questions, BBC, oh, Voice of America, everybody, this is because it went everywhere in the news because actually it was horrible for Tutsis, for survivor running genocide because it was the first time publicly to see a survivor forgiving because people said, no, this is, you betray us. How can you forgive? These people are, cannot be forgiven. They killed one million people during the genocide. So it was something horrible for, for Tutsis. And Vicent told me something. He said, Jean Paul, you know, you know why I accepted this forgiveness and I well, you know why I trust you. Because my wife told me that if I don't accept Jean Paul's forgiveness, that's what he put this word in my wife. He said, my wife told me if I don't accept your forgiveness, it, was, it means that I, I refuse God's forgiveness. It's because it's God who told you to forgive me. And he said, because you said that, I said, I can trust you and it's true. But before, my wife told me, when I learned that you will come to forgive me, I said, no, 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 this is a game. This is a political game. That's what that the word is he used. Mm. How a tooth can forgive me? I cannot forgive myself. How a tooth forgiving me with, with, with what we did? He said, no. But now you said in public, Jean Paul, and my wife told me, and the way you expressed that, Thank you, and I want to show you where the body of your father is. Because most of the survivors, yeah. until now, they struggle just but not knowing where the body are, they can honor their parents' house. So you do, when you have a cadaver, you, you honor. And, uh, so, Vincent showed me that, and um, in 2010, we were able with my relatives, uh, some survivors, you know, my brothers, uh, and my sister, who's still there alive, and to honor our father. But I didn't get and asked him, why now, why we can't we find, uh, where is the body of my mother? And he told me, you know, your mother was going to survive. But when she knew that we killed her husband, she was hide in the hiding place very, we couldn't even know. She was going to survive, but she came running, uh, crying. I said, oh, they killed my husband, they killed my husband, and then they killed her, but I don't know where the body is. So, in 2007, for the first time, Vicent and me, we decided to not stop. Even if people were threatening us, uh, saying we're gonna kill you, Jean Paul, we said we're gonna talk about this reconciliation. We're gonna organize uh, events where people we learn about this message of forgiveness. Then I started some put forgiveness campaign. I went to America, then I came back to Rwanda. I will go and I come back, I will go and I come back. And uh, in 2009, we organized the first huge international 
conference on forgiveness and Vissel spoke publicly how he killed my father and I spoke publicly how I forgave him. We were together and we organized interviews, many radios we call, we talk and we were not, we were not, we, we didn't have any fear. We were very strong, very strong, more than people who are treating us to kill us. We were may, very powerful and strong, more than them. So, since that time, the message of forgiveness became my daily life. I travel all over the world speaking about this message. And um, I would like to end with this thing. Can I ask you a question? Yes. First? Did Vincent, did he go through a process where he had deep regret? Did he cry in front of you? Yeah. Did he ask for you for forgiveness? Yeah. 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 He told me. Of course, you, you know, my story is, you know, you cannot say all things to take three, four days. I was going to say that, but I have to choose what to say and unless you give me four days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he was try. he told me he tried to find me, he wrote me a letter and I was gone, I was not there to ask for forgiveness. And, um, but he told me I was shocked how you forgive me before me to ask for forgiveness. That's why I couldn't understand how you forgive me and it's me who, who wronged, who, who did bad things to you. I was, I'm supposed to come and then you come and you forgive me. And that's why I told my wife, this is a political game. This is something I cannot. Then his wife was angry and they, and they said, he said, if you don't accept Jean Paul forgiveness, you will not come to my house because I'm, I forgave you because Jean Paul forgave you, because he taught me how to forgive you. So, though, then Vincent went to that process and actually Vincent was out of the prison because he confessed and he said, I know what I did. Look, people have killed. He told me he killed like 60 people. So. Uh, he was the principal of our village, the principal in the, he's somebody that time, very respected. When you are principal in the school, you are very respected at that time. So, uh, Vincent went to a process of asking for forgiveness uh, and he, that's why he was appointed, you know, he, he was out of the prison because after, when, when I was in Gachacha, he didn't go to prison again. No, he, he, he was like, he was free. Because when you, also, uh, you know, when you accuse about genocide, when you confess and he said, you, you name people who, who were, you know, who pushed others to kill, and he said the whole truth, they let you go out. But you do some work, they, they do some uh, community work, and the people, yeah, but they, but they go out of the prison. So he was, he was that kind of uh, uh, prisoner, but who confessed. So then he was lucky to come to the Kachacha, then found that a survivor, genocide Jean Paul, had forgiven him. So it was something very good for us, for him, for me, and. Uh, he was prepared, I was prepared. There was something like, uh, we, people say it's a miracle, how we got together in doing that gathering. And he was free, and I was free, and I came there with uh, this power, forgiving, not even worried because people were texting me. You come to the, you arrive in Butare, you are a dead person. I was having many texts, people. Then I was text back. We're gonna see who is gonna die because me, you don't know who told me to forgive. Because I was saying, God, is, the, the, the thought when I said the text, the thought is president of Rwanda. People were confused. They said, Why Jean Paul do this? Even the government is not doing anything. Government is supporting, but the government, they were also surprised. But they said, 
this is good. That's where, because our government in Rwanda is called a government of unity and reconciliation. So Jean-Paul Hasse and Vincent have shown that actually there are people that the government can say we are proud of them. This is citizen who are doing what we have been called. So people in government said it's good. They, are, they were even surprised because they didn't expect that. So it was an unknown as a singer. And that time I, when I came to Rwanda in 2007, I was already appointed as an ambassador and I, I had also another award called International Songwriting Competition in Nashville. I got that. I, went in, I came to Rwanda to celebrate that. So it was many things that at the same time I did the forgiveness. At the same time I'm celebrating uh, my award and actually I, I, I did, it was confusion, then I did the forgiveness. People say, this guy, what are we going to do? He's celebrating this, he's an honor for a country, but he's doing bad stuff, forgiving, we don't want to see that. But it, it was in the, in the time all was together. Being known, bringing awards, and doing those things about forgiveness, it was a perfect time to do that, and it was also the perfect time um, where people were so angry, People, you know, people traumatized. You see many survivors, genocide traumatized. You, they're living with a trauma. So, Vicente was ready, was already, he was prepared. I think God prepared him because if God prepared me, he will prepare him. Mm -hmm. That's what I can, I can tell you. So what has happened with the population as far as the, the larger um, population? in the last 10 years as far as uh, all that anger is directed at you, death threats and everything, where has the general population or your village or the whole country, um, how has your influence with forgiveness permeated through the country? So, in the beginning it was very difficult, people don't understand that, but some people generally wanted to, because it was, it was something which brings many discussions when the journalists were the journalists always like when something ah, like this then they were asking questions because then it helped me to talk about forgiveness and visit we talk with bbc we talk we, we were very we had energy we had energy and we were organizing conferences we talk we talk so Until now, some people agree, say this is good, yeah, we know, but it's difficult, but people understand, because people understand the forgiveness is for the ones who gives forgiveness. Mm -hmm. In the beginning it was difficult. And there are in the village people who do the same, many people, but they don't have exposure or radio or television to, to, to tell, to speak about that. So I did a tour in 2008 and nine in the schools and I, 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 I did even some clubs in the schools where young people were, who go now, until now they do, they speak about forgiveness. So I did that and this helped. So in the village, it's successful, but in the town, or in the intellectual people, they don't want. They don't want to hear a message of forgiveness. They don't want to hear that. They are against. Always I will find problems with people of my age, or people who are intellectuals, or people who, uh, who are religious even. They will not, they, they get nervous when we talk about forgiveness. But in the village, People who didn't go to school, mm. they are okay and they live freely. They are free, they are liberated, and you see that. That's how it is. That's, uh, to answer your question, that's how it is. But it's, it's still, I think we need, like, I, I can say in Rwanda, we need, even if we have like 200 people just to, who can talk about forgiveness, preach forgiveness. Even if we can have this 
preachers and uh, pastors, if we can have them stopping being religious and just being who, who they must to be. I'm not religious. Of course, I, I, I speak about Christianity, but sometimes I tell people, I'm not religious. What is your religion, Jean Paul? I say, my religion is love. That's what I always say. People say, it's strange. They don't understand. Mm -hmm. And the people who are Christian criticize me. We thought we were Christian like us. I'm, I'm, I'm a good one, not you. You are a bad one. Always <laughs> tell because you are against forgiveness. If you are, because most of they they, they don't agree. Mm. I went one day. I, I, I was angry, and I went to a radio, a Christian radio. They were talking with people. Say why? You? And I told them, you are not Christian, you guys. You are Hutu. Mm. And you, you are Tutsi. Say you are Tutsi and Hutu, but don't say you are Christian. Why? Because you are against forgiveness. If you are against forgiveness, you are not Christian. A Christian is the one, it's somebody, and I gave them a definition of Christian. A Christian is somebody who loves his enemies. It's somebody who loves his neighbors. You are not. So, it big challenge. Uh, we do many challenges in Rwanda, in the radio, in the... In the uh, we challenge them with that. I say, no, don't call yourself Christian. And those people, some of their pastors, these pastors who go there, you know, mm -hmm. who come and uh, we are bishop, and they, and they are not, they are just religious. Mm -hmm. And they're religious, religious. And, I'm, and I, I always tell them, every war, every genocide, religious people are behind. Religion is behind all the time. I don't, I'm against religion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They are like political parties. They are no. not. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a ways to go yet to <laughs> to deal with that. So, um, thank you for telling us all of that. That was quite a story. <laughs> um, he was going to sing another song. Right? Well, yeah, but no, we're still. This yeah, there's a song about forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. You well, become we will. We will. what you don't forgive. Yeah. Well, we will, but you know, we're going to go to other aspects of our conversation. Um, so in the last 10 years, since then, 10, 12 years, you have become an ambassador for peace and forgiveness and love, and you do that by traveling and touring and speaking and, and bringing your music. Um, you're now living in primarily the UK, right? That's yeah. sort of your home base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, your family is still in Eastern Canada. Canada, yeah. And um, so and you pretty much go everywhere. Like you're here in California because mm. you have a conference to go to in Sacramento, then you're mm. going to Venezuela and Nicaragua mm. and so forth. Um, what, uh, um, how do you see your career as it is developed? It's really lack of better term because career is, you know, you're not a career, you're, this is an expression of who you are. Mm. Um, where it has evolved from the last 10, 12 years since that point and how the world has received you and is, is embracing your message. Um, can you talk about that? Actually, it's good you ask me that question because it brings me the things I want to share with you here. Because uh, you, you just ask me like three questions in what you say. and. Um, I, will tell, um, I want to tell you and to share with you what I have discovered uh, in the world because I have been invited to speak this message in Australia, in South Korea, many places. But I can tell you what I found in this world. <sighs> That's why, to answer again the question where first, I dedicated my life to this and I'm gonna do this because I found that this world is miserable, I think I can say that genocide calls genocide, revenge calls revenge, violences calls violences. I have re it's, it's so sad when you see in the world what happens, what the problems, the war, the genocide, and you see these leaders that you elect, 
you, their mission instead to stop a war or instead to bring peace where when is needed they create another war just because they you tell them okay they said in Iraq there is a war please what America what can we do America they have everything in their hands to, to stop that war. What they will do? They will organize another war. Or they will <laughs> they transform this war to another one instead to stop the war. I, I got everywhere. And we do we we talk with people, we do workshops, and I found that this world is just a world of a culture of revenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, the wars, the violences are, are put always in the revenge because revenge calls revenge. Even in Rwanda, I, t I always tell them, if we don't embrace this message, this culture of forgiveness, it will happen on a just genocide. Because I know what the Hutu tells their children. I know what the Tutsi tell their children. We always transmit our trauma to our three children. And the generation of tomorrow, is he going to live with peace? Peace? No. It depends what we do now. Mm -hmm. So, this cycle of violences were created by who? I will tell you this, what I will speak in Sacramento. I went, I go to many conferences and people always, genocide, they talk about how it was horrible. They always bring what, the past, the wounds of the past. They always talk about, here is what the genocide happened. That, that then, but when you ask, how can we stop any future genocide? It's happening somewhere. What, how can you stop? They don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. They all, me, I will go. I will start my speech by saying how to stop any future genocide. What can we do? So, generation before our time, because they have not healed from the wounds of the past, they will pass on their grievances and trauma to the other generation. And it is we create cycle of violences and we find ourselves receivers of trauma and grievances from mm -hmm. conflicts rooted before our time. Sure. And the only way to stop any future genocide or the only way to, lead, to help generation in the future to live in peace the only way is to embrace this culture of forgiveness. We know revenge. Stop it in yourself. To yes. So another thing, that's why I have to. I want to tell you something. Also, we speak in the Sacramento. We need to be responsible. Mm -hmm. We need to be good ancestors. And this we are not going to do tomorrow. We have to do now. Our responsibility is me and you and to the future. Yes. Yeah. Be good ancestors. And that's what Pantera, I think that's what we'll yeah. be doing. Well, that's one of the primary tenets of what we are educating our members and, and we're about to really expand our presence in the world through the global media activities that we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And this is why you're coming here and talking about this is so specific and so synchronistic um, because we are launching <laughs> our true peace movement and dealing with the enemy which is within us which is our own split and as we've been talking about for the last 24 hours since you've been here um, hang on one second I'll get to that. Um, that 
as you know, my process and uh, the building of the knowledge that we have in, in law and the money system in world history, ultimately we discovered hardwired into the legal and the money system is what I coined a phrase called the enemy construct. Because the money system, people don't really understand that, most don't even believe it until I show them where it is, uh, but the money system, which is the flip side of the legal system, it is based on conflict, separation, yeah. polarity, and the enemy. And it capitalizes, we're talking about money, <laughs> the capital that the money system of war and conflict and separation is built on is the internal split within ourselves. And in your story, your story is so archetypal. You are, you are bigger than yourself, <laughs> you know, and that experience that you talk about, uh, you know, whether it was God speaking to you or a higher principle of your own being, it's one and the same, those are just words. Um, but I see, in my perception, being friends and knowing you for eight years now, that it was a very specific thing. You know, the, uh, the colonial master that brought its disease to its colonies, whether in Asia, South America, Africa, um, was trained and programmed to bring separation, conflict, and divide and conquer principles. Mm -hmm. And Africa is such a primary point of generation for this world, for the races of the world and so forth. And this is a conflict that you described that's not 10 years old or three generations, mm -hmm. it's thousands of generations, yeah. millions. It's an ancestral lineage that we all hold in our, in our own like genetics. Well, it's a curse, but it's a self-created um, uh, disease that the human race is purging of itself, mm. you know, and then your life, uh, you came into this life um, to be who you are today, to be an ambassador, to speak about this, to understand that, you know, you're not speaking about it intellectually, you're speaking about it from deep experience. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, so few of us can even come close to comprehending what that journey you've been on what that would be like to have your best friends do that to your own family and have a whole country do that but right in the heart of africa you know you said it's east africa but it's east but it's right in the center of mm -hmm. africa you know that that primordial split in the human condition of its own self-loathing that hatred of separation that we project outside of ourselves to an enemy, whoever that is, whether it's the Hutus against the Tutsis, or blacks against whites, or east against west, mm. this is the primordial disease of the human race. Mm. And you came in to experience it, to go to the depths of the despair that that created, and the self-loathing, you wanted to kill yourself, you wanted to revenge outside of yourself, mm. until you resolved it. And so that voice was your higher self, your higher principle, that divine principle that we are, that our language calls God or source or creator or whatever, mm -hmm. saying it's enough, we have to heal this. If we don't heal it, we will destroy our entire existence as a global species and a planet. Okay, mm -hmm. So that's why I ask about your the evolution of the last 10 years, how you are experiencing it up until now, with your interaction through all of the things you do, through music and speaking and conferences and so forth, um, you know, maybe on a scale of one to a hundred, a hundred being where we really actually collectively forgive ourselves on this planet for the, the destruction and the hate and the war and the um, violence that we've created and allowed and supported on a scale of one to a hundred, you know, maybe we're at one and a half percent. <laughs> we have a long way to go. Mm. But we are very powerful beings, and that's what we talk about in Pantera all the time, literally mm. every day. The power of what we can do to break through this frozen consciousness, that, that mindset of divide and conquer to capitalize on the separation and the polarity 
and monetize it and make money and control resources and people and countries, uh, that is shifting right now. And that is the mission and the purpose of Pantera mm. through media and education mm. to bring this to the world. And our media is going to be full spoke spectrum and it's not going to focus on, you know, like what you were saying, you go to conferences, well, let's talk about the wounds of the past, mm -hmm. you know, and then we just recreate it. And then we get this visceral sense of it and we go, a lot of people go to movies and the media that's currently been foisted on the human population, all about violence and war. And then, you know, it used to be cowboys and Indians 50 years ago. <laughs> now it's humans against aliens, <laughs> you know, but we've met the aliens and they are us and we have to deal with it. There's nothing outside of us. Um, Andrew just gave me a quote from attributed to Confucius, which says, before you embark on a journey of revenge, dig two graves because you will kill yourself, you know. So if you had fulfilled that, that impetus to revenge against Vincent and the other man, you would have killed yourself, you would have destroyed yourself, and you woke up to that understanding, and he woke up to that, mm. okay. so. So this is why... Yeah, let me prove. Go ahead. Let, let me tell Andrea something. Vincent was okay. He was in prison. In prison they eat. They dance even. They have some... <laughs> they, they, they have some... <laughs> time where they dance every... Vincent was just... Okay. He was in prison because of what he did. He deserved it. But my prison was more horrible, more than his. He killed my father. Mm -hmm. He's there in prison, he's eating, but me, I was dying every day. So, revenge, what you just, this is, <laughs> this is the, I was carrying Vincent everywhere. 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 What, what he did, oh, uh, everywhere. So I was to, and he was heavy. And getting heavier. Yeah. So, just one day, I was able to, mm. just by just choice, just to say yes only, it was all, was gone. So, revenge, that's what I said, I said revenge calls revenge, and revenge kills yourself, you know. Sometimes we think your real enemy is the other who wronged you. No, your real enemy is your... Your own separation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake that this Vincent... Even was in he, prison. He too. was in prison, but he, he... You cannot kill somebody and not... But he, he killed 60 people. Mm -hmm. 60 so he people. was he was in a deeper prison too. Yeah. But... Um, yeah. I'd like to shift the conversation a bit. Um, and, um, well, yesterday we were talking about uh, racial roots and you were telling us about some things that, that I didn't know before in terms of, um, and you talked about a little bit earlier as far as who the Hutu were, who the Tutsis were, you talked about the Belgium uh, colonization, which basically was, was primarily focused on the Congo. Mm -hmm. And there's, for anybody watching this, there's a quite extraordinary book, if you want to learn some of the history behind what he talked about, called King Leopold's Ghost, and it's about Leopold II. Uh, Belgium was a uh, created state in the 19th century, mm -hmm. and so they had to have a, a monarch for it, so they picked a uh, cousin of Queen Victoria's, mm -hmm. Leopold, and they put him in as the king, and Leopold II was his, uh, was his son and heir to the throne, mm -hmm. and he was a very greedy man, <laughs> and very self-focused, and the epitome of, of the, you know, the opposite of what we're talking about. You know, and it's what I call the, you know, the, the European disease. <clears throat> um, but it's more than just racial as far as European. I mean, it's the disease of this world, that, that mm -hmm. self-interest, self-focus, that unsatiable uh, compulsion to greed and power and ego and control and all of that, 
which is what we're having to face in this whole world process of, of purging and healing. Mm -hmm. And he looked around and all of his cousins, well, the British, they got all kinds of colonies, and the French, they have colonies, and the Germans have colonies. I don't have a colony. And he looked on the map and he found, oh, there's this big swath of land in the middle of Africa <laughs> that was called the Congo, which is when I grew up, I remember the phrase, the Belgian Congo. Mm -hmm. Had no clue what it was. And that book goes into how, what he did and who he worked with, and he worked with, uh, rem remember, uh, uh, Dr. Livingston and Stanley. Dr. Livingston, I presume, <laughs> you know, that phrase, the two great explorers. Well, Stanley was basically a orphan and a scrambler and a huckster and what have you, and he huckstered his way up the ladder and got involved with Livingston and basically came back, got involved with Leopold mm -hmm. and they did this whole promotion of, well, we're there to help the people of Africa and this whole spin. And in actual fact, and this is when the rubber boom um, happened and the ivory boom in the middle of the 1800s and they went in and they just, this whole area of uh, and I didn't realize that they were in Rwanda and Burundi. Mm -hmm. um, so that whole area is considered yeah. the Congo. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they really, Leopold and Stanley was out, you know, hustling in parlors in America and Europe and getting money and support and oops. Um, and um, to uh, support this, and it was all based on this, this facade of humanitarian efforts and bringing the church to the natives and all that kind of stuff and they ended up killing 10 million people okay and in horrendous conditions to build belgian congo and, and harvest ivory and rubber um, and ultimately when we really look at it we talk about war and the monetization of war and the extraction and exploitation of, of wealth on the backs of the native people who are the real stewards of the land. It's all about extracting raw resources to feed this machine, to maintain and perpetuate war and violence and conflict in this world. And, uh, and this is a collective, if you could call it sin. Sin means to miss the mark. And what's the mark? The mark is the alignment with who we really are as living beings and honor life and all honor each other as living beings and honor the world as a living being. Uh, so the collective sin of humanity is what we're facing and having to face, mm -hmm. having supported all of this and supported, you know, the illusion that we're colonizing, we're bringing God to the natives and all this kind of crap, because it is crap. Um, but that's the root, the energetic root that was planted as a deep seed that, that really in a deeper level access this primordial wound of separation that we have in this world and in this human race that Africa is a primary location and your country, your people represent or not even represent are a resonant holding pattern of that. So what we talked about yesterday that you taught us that, that we didn't know before we we're asking, well, who are the Hutu, who are the, the Tutsis? And they, um, they had certain racial characteristics, but then there's a third race, which we know as the Pygmies, you said the 1%. And they, are, uh, they hold a sound resonance. We talked about song and the song of the Pygmies and so forth, which you were singing, I think, in the beginning of, of your song, um, which I'd like you to share some more. Talk to us about that aspect, that unifying field, and what healing this wound in Africa has to do, and what the work that Pantera plans to do, not only through the media and education, but we're going to um, be doing work like what we thought we would do starting eight years ago when Roy introduced us and so forth, of being, bringing real mutual benefit projects and support to help build lives and communities and nations. So get to that in a minute, but talking about the, uh, the roots of the music that you grew up with and, and the racial um, grounding point with the, the pygmies and the language, and you talk about a unified language in your, your country, so can you talk about that? Mm -hmm. now, as I told you before, the, the 
Rwanda, Hutu, Tutsi, Epigmies, they speak, we all speak in Rwanda, one language. When you see other tribes like, um, like uh, Uganda, when a Yug Muganda, there is a language called Kiganda, Luganda. When there is a tribe called Choli, they have a language Choli. Actually, in Rwanda, we should have a Hutu language, a Tutsi language, and a Batua language. But we all have Kenya Rwanda. And I ask myself, why? Why we don't have Hutu language? Because when you go to Congo, any tribe has his own language. And style of music. Um, Hutus and, and Tutsi, they sing, like in singing. But there's no difference. There's no style called in Tutsi style, uh, Hutu style. But we have in what was what style. When we go to Rwanda, I grew up knowing that, oh, this is in Tuatua. And we're all loving it. We love Abatua when we see them. We, well, me, I respect them. Abatua is it? The pygmy race. The pygmy. Yeah. yeah. They are always neglected. Yeah. They we when Hutu or Tuts are together, a Mutwa will not share in the table. They will go to eat there. Mm. It's so sad, it's bad. So this is something uh, I grew up I grew up seeing that. That a Mutwa is the somebody who who performs or sing in the wedding. Or when they say come, if you see the the people like like here when people s s sing in the street, you give them coins. In Rwanda, always they were pygmies. They have a stanza they play, and they are good singers, and they have something uh, you know un unique in their music. And uh, it's good you ask me a question about uh, pygmies' voice because. Um, I always tell them I owe you because of your music. I won many awards just because mm. because of your music. And when I won the, the competition in New York, I went to Rwanda and I brought two pygmies. Uh, I, I brought five people, but two were among our pygmies. And everybody asked me, why you bring these pygmies in America? And this is bad. You cannot, there are, there are survivors of genocide. There are people who said, I are survivors of genocide. There are, there are human, There's, there are others human, bring them. Somebody said that and I was very angry. And I was, I wanted to do, to, I was seeing just music. I was not seeing who, I, I don't know how to choose uh, just a knee. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not like that. When you go to do a band as a musician, you don't choose it. So, a Hutu. By, by race, you yes. choose by But uh, the people who do that in Rwanda, they have been doing it. So no, I cannot perform with Hutu, I cannot perform with Tutsi. So, for me, uh, and I told you also, the, this man uh, who is at a university in Miami, he did a dissertation about uh, the music, the Pygmy's music I do. And he did that. And he has this um, link we, I think I, wish I shared with that with you, I will send you again. So, the pygmies, the Abatwa, uh, they are unique. Uh, they are unique the way they sing, the way they dance, the rhythm called 5-8. Uh, this is the rhythm, it, it's hard to dance. Mm -hmm. Five eight, but for them they dance five eight, and uh, because it's complicated, but mm -hmm. they do that. They are just pygmies, and uh, they say Can we you? are the only ones. When you meet a mutwa, he will tell you we are number one. We are the only ones who play. With, you say? I was going to ask: Is it possible for you to simply demonstrate that rhythm, just even just like tapping? Yeah, I was going to do that. Yeah, we'll get okay. to that. Let okay. me okay. finish. Yeah. yeah, you know, one two three four five. One two. They clap like this. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Yeah, yeah.
Then you hear that they always sing like 20 people. Then you will hear that. Uh, Yeah, the mountains, they like to sing their, how they are brave. There are people who, they, they, who they, they, they means, uh, you know, people criticize them that they, they praise themselves. They say, we are, we are number one, we are good, nobody can conquer us, we are, we are just, we are created. You know, sometimes they, they may say, the other, we are humans, and the other, we don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They are the aliens. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know what? No, they found out. They found us. The the, the camp, Rwanda is ours. Who came after them? Who came? But they found us here. We, they are our, you know, they the are our land. People. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're the real they stewards of the land. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, in our research and study of history at many levels, not just all the facts and figures, but the esoteric and the multidimensional, um, this earth is extremely unique in the universe, in the many universes, and it is a fountain of life that is intended to spread life throughout many realms. And there are original races on this earth who are founder races, who were one with the land. Mm -hmm. And when you describe that, I mean, it's so obvious that's who they were. Mm -hmm. And there's different races in different places, like in Hawaii, they call them the Menahuni, and in, mm -hmm. in the British Isles, they call them leprechauns, mm -hmm. and in Iceland, they call them the elves. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're all those original peoples, and mm -hmm. some are still in the physical form in human or seemingly human bodies, and mm -hmm. some are like shifted in frequency. And that's why I want to, because to me, race, language, and music, they, that's that's frequency, that's resonance. Mm. And when that resonance is harmonic mm. with the land, then that's what peace is. That's true life that's holding a resonance with this world which yeah. is intended to produce life. Mm. And what we're talking about is the layering of the parasite, the division, the split in the consciousness and getting humans collectively to project their movie that they're playing inside. And that movie, unfortunately, up till now, or for a very long time, has been separation, polarity, violence, mm -hmm. conflict, and war. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what our intent and purpose as Pantera, which means across the world, Pan as across and Terra as the earth, mm -hmm. is to create a platform through the gemstone media and bringing culture and race and and joy and, and life and music and mm -hmm. and you know art um, and and when we're talking about media it's not going to be about education. the an education it's going to be it's not going to be about all the negative and the war and, and repeating that cycle we're going to focus on what is beautiful and alive in this world and so you know and all these hidden places where life is still holding that grounding point mm -hmm. like the pygmies you know who well, i didn't even realize till yesterday i mean we all grew up here in, in the united states oh yeah pygmies you're little people and yeah. you know had no clue who they were <laughs> literally until yesterday i mean you know i didn't look into it and we're yeah. pretty advanced in studying history and the it world is. and stuff like that <laughs> um so Oh, well, Andrea has it. She's Deep Forest is the name of the album. Oh, she had an album called Deep Forest, which Deep was Forest. the yeah. uh, Pygmies. And, but anyways, a lot of it was new for me yesterday. Yeah. Um, and I see things in these multi-layers and I see how, you know, this infestation through Leopold and European colonization and extraction of resources to get the rubber and the uh, ores and uranium and gold and diamonds out of this 
place called Africa to build their war machine. Okay. Now we're going to shift it. That's yeah. who we are. That's what Pantera is. That's what Gemstone is. Gemstone stands for. That's what I was saying. Our responsibility. Yeah. For the other generation. Yeah. We have to take responsibility because yeah. yes. we are more powerful than yes. that disease, that yeah. Yeah. primal wound. Yeah. Um, so Gemstone Media, which is going to start really growing here, um, is going to be about bringing unity consciousness, mm. the awareness that we are more powerful than that war machine and yes. there is another way and that other way has always been here deeply hidden and so the holding of that resonance in the center of Af Africa by these little people yeah. and the Menahunis in Hawaii and the leprechauns and the yeah. elves and so forth yeah. you know they're saying you know it's about time you guys woke up quit yeah. doing this yeah. stuff to each other and yourselves so um, anything else you'd like to share about the pygmies and the music and the what I just said. Um, <clears throat> you want to, uh, another? You want me to share? Uh, yeah, anything you you know that you know you, about what? I was going to sing that song. You wanted the forgiveness song. Yeah, we'll end with that. Okay, yeah, we're not quite at the end yet, but if what, you want to do some more pygmy singing, yeah, I now. can do with the guitar. Oh. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Um, we may come back and do part two with more conversation about uh, what we're doing, where we're going, and Jean-Paul's role as uh, the ambassador of peace and forgiveness for Pantera and for the world and for all people. Um, but we're going to shift focus and we're going to have Jean-Paul do some more music for us and some more singing. So Jean-Paul, take it away. This is um, a pygmy song um, in Kenya, Rwanda. The song is, is say, all is yours. It, I think they were praising God, saying you created everything. It's yours. I give you back. I give you everything. I, praise is yours. All we have here is yours. It's a song about, um, sometimes pygmies we sing a very di difficult King Rwanda. You will not know, you will know just a few words and then some words are very difficult. You will not understand what, because some songs are old song from the ancestors. So this one is, all is yours. <laughs>
you don't forgive. That's right. Mm. And, you become, and you become what you create. Yes. So.
Gracias. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> One more. One more. I will choose Karibu Mungu. It's a Swahili song. Swahili because uh, Swahili is a good language. It's good. And uh, this song is known in Kenya, in Uganda. It's a well-known song I, have, I did in 2006. And um, it's good to share with you the Swahili. I'm 
It just comes like that, but we can, we have to do it. Yeah, do it, do it. Bunch of pygmies standing on the stage. All right, we're out. All right.